Hello and welcome everyone to today's special Student Couch episode. My name is Yunus and today I'm very happy to be back on this fourth episode of Season 2. In today's episode I'll be talking with Mark, a communication science alumnus who now teaches at the UVA. For those tuning in for the first time, this show is designed and dedicated to understanding the student's story, perspective, voice and concerns. As a reminder, the full audio version of this episode is available on Spotify and the full video will be available on YouTube. Now, if you haven't yet, get your coffee or your tea and join us for the next half an hour with Mark. Mark, it's great to have you on this episode. How are you doing? Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Um, what have you been up to for the past few days? past few days have just been busy working. Yeah, like you said, I, uh, I've graduated from the, the program, did my uh, bachelor's and master's at the UFA Communication Science, and now I'm uh, working as a junior lecturer. So I haven't moved very far, just upstairs. And uh, yeah, now I'm busy teaching and uh, grading and giving lessons. Awesome. How was that transition going from a student of communication science to being a teacher? I've always wanted to teach, so that's not the, the big jump. That's mm -hmm. the part that I think comes a bit more naturally. But um, yeah, you just you get to see everything from behind closed doors now. The other half of the perspective that you don't get to see when you're a student. Um, but it's really nice to start a new job and to know your colleagues already. So all of my teachers and professors are now my coworkers. So that makes uh, the learning curve a bit easier. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so where are you from? I'm from California, from near San Francisco. Cool. And so you yeah. moved here? Um, I moved here, yeah, four years ago, a bit more than that now, when mm -hmm. I was 20. Just wanted to, to do something uh, wild and random. And uh, I knew I wanted to study communication science. I really liked the research focus we have here. I know a lot of people probably don't even know how much research they're going to be doing until they get here, mm -hmm. but I was, I think, one of the, the weirdos who, who looked for that on purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I miss my California weather a lot. Days like this are, are okay, but it's been a, a cold, rainy week. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, sometimes I just hope there's more sun, but you just got to sort of adapt yep. to your expectations yep. and manage those things. Yeah, um, that's awesome. So you're, what do you currently teach? Right now I'm teaching MCRS, uh, Persuasive Communication. And I also assist with a master's elective called Organizational Behavior and Communication. That's awesome. And is there a course that you prefer teaching out of those? Or is, there, is it just a general teaching experience yeah. that you enjoy? I don't think I could pick my favorites. Maybe my students are listening, so hi. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, it, I like teaching the methods part a lot because that's really interesting to me, but uh, Persuasive is a writing class and that's really fun as well to see and help students improve their, their writing over time. We're placing a bigger emphasis on this now in the department, so. Yeah, absolutely, and even the sort of the statistics combined with the research I think is something the program um, sort of excels in. It's yeah. like uh, really what makes, what what adds the value to the program of communication science is the whole research aspect. Definitely. It's a good skill that you get as a student over time, obviously. It really helps you've done so much research when you want to look for a job or an internship, or even just to prepare you better to do your uh, your bachelor's thesis, your master's thesis, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you're, so last year you were working on your master's thesis, right? Yeah. Cool. What was that about? Yeah, so I was... Uh, I did my master's thesis in corporate communication. That's sort of like my personal favorite, so that's what I'm uh, interested in. Mm -hmm. And I uh, researched how LGBT employees come out at work. Okay. So how queer professionals come out in a, a very corporate workspace. Um, and it was really interesting. There's, there's uh, research about this, but uh, not looking specifically at like a, a corporate environment and how that might uh, impact it. Sort of the norms of what's professional behavior or not, or what's, uh, what's crossing a personal boundary or something. How, how can you express your identity in, in a corporate world that's supposed to be very uh, competitive, macho, uh, straight, white, male environment? Yeah, um, that seems really interesting. And actually, I was, I was reading Margaret's article on Media Magazine. That's actually how I found out about your initiative that we're going to be talking about yep. today, the Queer Communication Library. Um, and so I imagine that through your master's thesis as you were doing research, it kind of led to this idea of the 
queer communication yeah. library. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you got that idea? Sure, definitely. So um, maybe I'll give the backstory first and then explain what the, the library itself is. But in the mm -hmm. process of writing my master's thesis, I'm collecting all of this research and, and interesting literature, but uh, it's not anything I've been kind of taught in the program how to how to to think about this type of subject or how to deal with yeah these matters of uh, inclusive communication or or how to use a, a queer theory uh, framework uh, as a research method so I'm collecting all this research and I have the idea I might as well share it hopefully it will someday make its way into the program or it can help uh, their students as well so I start uh, putting this uh, literature matrix, reading list together, just of the articles I was using, and then uh, with the help of a small team, we kind of launched in into a bigger uh, library project. So yeah, we call it the Queer Communication Library, and it's uh, just a collection of resources and literature that deal with queer communication. Obviously tailored to communication science so the library is broken down into the program groups um, and there's also a, a general communication section and so those groups are kind of like persuasive communication yeah exactly so the domains that all the students follow mm -hmm. uh, in the bachelor's or the master's uh, degrees that are offered as well so yeah we have a section on corporate communication which has a lot of literature on things like well coming out at work but also um, uh, how uh, HR policies infect queer employees or uh, new research coming out about how companies might market or brand or advertise during Pride Month or something like that. Mm -hmm. But in the other domains as well, there's lots of different uh, research that cover the other the other topics. That's awesome. And so you, you kind of realized that there was this kind of gap in yeah. the in the availability of resources in a way. Right? Is that, yeah, is that the yeah. gap that you noticed, or yeah? Like I said, you know, I had to uncover all of this uh, knowledge on my own, which is a part of the master's process, is to to work that out. But I was a bit shocked in my four years uh, as a student. Mm -hmm. I had never read an article that talked about uh, queer communication or just inclusive uh, communication explicitly. It it came up a few times, and we talked about diversity in general a few times, but. Uh, I wanted something more specific, and I thought, you know, this could help other students research if they know where to find resources, mm -hmm. but it could also help teachers hopefully uh, replace some old literature in courses, refresh the reading lists of their course manuals, um, or also just be available for uh, the researchers in the department who also want to look and fill where the knowledge gaps still are. Absolutely, and I think that's that's something that's that's really important to have. I mean, at least being more inclusive of the student population yeah. and just of the research that's actually available out there. Um, and so, most of the most of the articles or the research papers on the queer communication library would be revolved around queer theory and communication, or is there some other sort of uh, theoretical links to? Yeah. Yeah. So we think about it in three ways. Mm -hmm. There are uh, some articles there that are queer from the researcher side. So the researchers uh, doing the work themselves come from the community, so they're able to focus on the community uh, and have a bit more of that personal understanding. Mm -hmm. um, that's the researcher side. The second side is the participant side or the sample side. So studies that either uh, survey or uh, yeah interview queer people to understand their experience. Mm -hmm. And then the third side is uh, way more methodological, using queer theory as a framework, as a as a tool to build, uh, yeah, kind of uh, an approach to doing or conducting research. And some articles, good ones, will mix all three of these probably. That's awesome. I love how kind of comprehensive it is in yeah. terms of including um, including it in all different aspects of the research. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So it's it, this is both uh, an epistemology and a method and a, a tool to use at the same time. That's really cool. And so uh, as I was reading through your your sort of mission, I noticed that um, I'm just going to read off the, the, the quote that I, Please, yeah. that I noticed on there. So um, the mission of the Queer Communication Library is our project aims to address this knowledge gap by creating a student-led crowdsourced repository of communication science resources that emphasize queerness. The resources we include would be suitable to include across the department, 
helping to further decolonize education for future generations. Now, as I was reading this, um, one word specifically kind of um, really came across my eye and really caught my attention, which was decolonize education. Mm -hmm. Now, previously I never thought of decolonizing education as something that would be used in this context, um, especially coming from a country that has a colonial past right. and things like that. I often think of decolonization as, um, you know, something around colonizers coming into a country and leaving and things like that. Um, so how does this decolonizing education sort of relate to um, queer theory or to the queer communication library? Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, thanks for <laughs> reading off the mission because I don't <laughs> know it off the top of my head anymore. Yeah. But um, yeah, in two ways. I mean, uh, queer theory, t to put it in a nutshell, I is just the, uh, the studying of how othering works. So how uh, a majority group turns a, a minority group into the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it doesn't always have to be queer people. I, in most cases, that's what we think it is, but it, it applies to just understanding how this othering uh, process works. So in this colonial setting, it's how the colonizer will, will other uh, their uh, subjects or something like that. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a lot more important decolonization work to do at the UFA that deals specifically with the Dutch context and the Dutch uh, history. But uh, queer topics have also been uh, systemically left out of higher education for mm -hmm. quite a long time. They're uh, underfunded, they, uh, there are institutional barriers to conducting research like this. Uh, in some uh, departments, you know, researchers don't feel empowered to take on topics like this if it's harder to get it published or if they fear that there'll be uh, there'll be some sort of backlash. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe students also don't feel comfortable doing this if they don't want to be singled out as, as the one person who, who does all the queer topics for their work. Um, so I think removing those barriers is also a form of, I think, moving away from sort of this, uh, yeah, traditional uh, heterosexual patriarchal structure that is still very much the norm at, in uh, education. Absolutely, I, I completely agree with that, but do you think, I mean, um, do you think that the use of the word decolonization could create some sort of um, confusion to people who are yeah. trying to understand better the situation? And do you think there could be a word that could be used better than this? Not in any way saying I disagree with any of these things, but just in terms of the word choice. Do you yeah, think there's yeah. something that could be better in terms of that? It's a really valid point. You know, the words we picked when we were writing this mis mission statement were meant to be uh, very uh, visceral. We, we needed to get attention from the department to mm -hmm. get support for this project, and we needed to get attention from uh, people who wanted to uh, endorse the work as well. But it's something we've uh, elaborated on, and we have a, a longer document which we kind of talk about the role, the tiny role we play in decolonization. Just as an example, um, you know, we suggest that other libraries are set up someday that talk about feminist communication, indigenous communication, uh, racial theory and communication, other topics that can focus on uh, inclusive uh, communication. So it does play uh, a small role, and, and the word itself is definitely used to make our appeal uh, more persuasive, but mm -hmm. also to bring up questions like this as well. Because uh, like I mentioned, you know, this is also a question of uh, intersectionality. So there are uh, indigenous peoples and people of color who are queer, mm -hmm. who probably need research attention even more than the topics we're already looking at. Absolutely, and I think it's, uh, if I actually look back at my past three years, yeah. I think I've never stumbled upon research in a class or in any situation within the context of communication science where minority groups were involved in the research, right. maybe as research participants, but not as uh, the main topic or looking at it as in how, how can minorities be more included into a sure. company or something like that. So I definitely see that as um, something important. How, how have you experienced sort of being a uh, being part of the LGBTQ mm -hmm. plus community here in Amsterdam and part of the uni university. Well, that's such a beautiful thing about uh, being here in Amsterdam, right? Of course, is the reputation that the the city has, and I think that UFA takes over some of that reputation 
just being the city's uh, university or something like that. Um, so in general, yeah, there haven't been uh, huge issues to overcome, except uh, for topics like this, something that I think we have a nice niche that we could focus on with the department. And we're really, uh, now speaking as a teacher here, you know, we're really interested in, in promoting more uh, diversity discussions among students or research that we want to conduct. But it uh, still takes a lot of uh, organizing and a lot of time. And all the the research that the university has done on, on diversity, both in curriculum and in the population, uh, says that we still have a lot of uh, work to go. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think even the the aspect that there isn't really a library or uh, re resources other than this one yeah. or prior to this one that um, offer like a centralized place to access this, this research yeah. makes it that so when students are conducting their own research, the thought of doing something in relation to queer theory or, or, or to anything around this or to uh, communication and uh, something around minorities sure. does not even come across their mind. Yeah, and I mean, we have lots of interesting theories in the program and lots of fantastic things to, to research and communication science is such a beautiful domain because it's so broad and uh, interdisciplinary already, mm -hmm. but maybe this is one uh, branch that's less represented at the moment. I th agree with you. I think mm -hmm. in my time as a student, maybe I've had one article that's been uh, assigned reading mm -hmm. that singles out a, a particular uh, group and how they can be better accommodated. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like also in terms of um, in terms of our world's needs currently, yeah. in terms of communication as well, it's like probably dealing with minorities is probably one of the issues in communication that is not the most important, but one of the most important issues to be um, looking at and to be uh, to be really researching much sure. more. Yeah. And in a way, this is, you know, this is not a new issue. Mm -hmm. It's getting a lot of attention now because it's becoming a more popular issue. But getting ahead of this uh, research curve, having a generation of researchers that understand this uh, theory and why it's important, mm -hmm. as well as other feminist theories and, and other types of uh, diversity research, that's going to help us keep our, our ranking and our spot <laughs> in the world someday if, if this is a, a branch that we can also really uh, excel at in the department. Absolutely. And so now on the library, you have over 100 resources mm -hmm. available. Um, and so it's it's all on an Excel sheet. It's yeah. all organized on there per... Yeah. So that's the, that's the really fun part. It's a still crowdsourced, open source. It's hosted in a Google Sheet. So anyone can go on there and scroll through the tabs, look through the pages, find literature that they want, but also contribute literature. It only takes a minute to fill out... Uh, uh, the line for the article, the metadata that we want, mm -hmm. and that allows us to also see where some of the literature gaps uh, remain. Mm -hmm. And now we're also opening it up to, I think, more popular sources as well, besides uh, strictly academic sources. But I know it's already uh, having an impact. I've had two teachers mention to me, like, hey, I, I needed to replace some outdated uh, literature in the course manual, so I, I quickly looked and found something from the list. That's this, awesome. As teachers, we don't have a lot of time to, to reinvent and refocus, even though that's what we desperately want to. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a way to kind of uh, serve it up already. That's really <laughs> and, awesome. And as you mentioned, yes, students who want to learn more on their own can treat it as a reading list, yeah. Mm -hmm. And even researchers themselves can use it to yeah. identify those gaps uh, as well. But what do you think are some of these knowledge gaps that are still valuable to explore currently? Yeah, so there's a tool in the library right now. We have a, a stats overview where you can look at the, the bibliometrics of the library itself, and you can see where, like per subdomain, the, the gaps still exist. Uh, maybe it just means we haven't found this work yet, or at least it's hard to find, which is also a problem. But there's a lot of topics, I think, um, I think straight to persuasive communication, almost all of the research there is in health communication, almost all of that research there is about HIV prevention. There's a lot more going on that affects the queer community than that, but of course that research is urgent and important and gets funded very often, mm -hmm. but there's more topics uh, we could be looking at. Uh, entertainment communication as well is always, I think, focused about like 
portrayals of promiscuity and entertainment, which is kind of a outdated stereotype to move away from. There's a lot more things we could be looking at in entertainment like that. Mm -hmm. And then in political communication, you know, we have a lot of debates today about the place of LGBT refugees, especially in this country, um, and the way that that might be uh, pitted against other uh, refugee narratives. But again, if we look at this intersectionally, sometimes they're the same people, mm -hmm. and they're the people who need the research uh, focus the most on them. Absolutely, I think that's that's really important. So, how can people really contribute to this library? There's a few things that uh, students can do, of course. One is to bookmark the library so you have it if you need it someday, but also uh, to contribute, add literature to it. It takes only a few minutes if you want to block out time, and we have instructions there how you can quickly search through a database, or if you've ever written a paper about this, you can just add up your reference list. Um, but also start to think, you know, how can I have a small reflection in the assignments that I write that focuses on diversity, inclusivity, decolonization, maybe not from a queer side, but whatever side you're uh, interested in. Mm -hmm. And then for teachers as well, like I said, this is meant to be a tool that they can take the literature from. Um, we're thinking about how we can have some sort of inclusive communication elective someday. So working on a plan for that, um, and obviously making sure that teachers know about it so they can point their students to it. Awesome, I wish you the best of luck with that. Yeah. And um, So will it be something that always remains on the Excel sheet or are you, or do you have other plans for it? So we have to figure out a new shape for it this semester. Obviously this was a student project last semester when I was a student. Mm -hmm. Now we're working on making it some sort of permanent uh, department resource. So you know, at the moment I'm still leading that charge but someday it will have, I think, a more permanent home. Uh, but in the meantime, yeah. The Google Sheets is serving it really well. Everyone's able to access it. And uh, yeah, we'll have to see where, where it ends up, but it will definitely stay with, with us at uh, the UFA Communication Science. Awesome. Um, at least it's a step forward, that yeah. it, uh, even if it's um, taking a while to be set up uh, to the way that you would want it yeah. or the way that you envision it, it's still a step forward, and I think that's, that's really awesome. So is there any other way that people can help out um, other than by contributing or by reading? Yeah, it. sure. If, if, uh, if you're even more interested in helping out, you know, they can, uh, they can reach out to me or someone else on the team. We, we're listed there with our, our contact info and we'll, we're setting up like a new environment so we can collaborate on things together. Maybe you have ideas about uh, the policy this can take or want to help writing some of our implementation uh, strategy or as well kind of reaching out for the outreach side of things. So it's, uh, I think, a fun group if you want to join. And I think what's nice, finally now, that this has moved from a, a student uh, protest piece to, I think, hopefully a real department resource is that we get to include uh, teachers and staff as well in this decision-making process. And that will really help the, the, the bridge uh, be built. Absolutely. I think that's everything about the Career Communication Library is really awesome. and. Uh, um, really, I think it's a great initiative for um, people in general and being more inclusive with research and just having having people actually have their voice somewhere. Yeah. Um, and I think that's just really awesome. Now, thank you so much for being with us today um, and talking to us about the Queer Communication Library. Uh, of course, if you would like to learn more, you can check out uh, the article by Margaret on Medium's website. Or you can also, of course, follow the links in the captions below. Um, of course, none of this would be possible without the incredible team at Medium Magazine who help us promote this episode and, of course, everyone else involved in making this happen. You can, of course, join us next week for another episode of The Student Couch. And be sure to send us your suggestions for future topics and guests that you would like to see next. This show was brought to you by Medium Magazine, the fully student-led magazine of communication science. To learn more or check out our latest articles, you can visit our website, www.mediamagazine.nl. To join our team, be sure to check out our open positions in our latest posts or on our website. My name is Yunus, this was Tuning Couch, and I'll see you all next week. <laughs>